I found it on Rayma Radio. Hi, this is Jason, the station director of Rayma Radio. I want to thank you for your support in making the ministry what it is today. Since our launch in 2016, we've consistently released two shows weekly. We've featured sermons and songs from churches and talents all across Malaysia. We've been privileged to have on our shows thought leaders from education, family, government, arts, media, business, and the church. Our mission field is the digital space. Our task is to create and curate content that is God-inspired and relevant to the world we live in today, to be a platform for kingdom unity, to be a resource center for the coming famine that is not of food and water, but of God's word. This is our assignment, and we have experienced the grace of God upon us to do this. So many testimonies have been birthed out of this ministry. We want to reach a wider audience and be a blessing to more, but we need your support. At the moment, Rema Radio is not backed by any one church, organization or business. It is powered by volunteers. While I'm encouraged by the handful of supporters who has given, we need more partners. If you believe there is a need for positive, faith-inspired Malaysian content, why don't you consider partnering with us? Go to rema.rad.io forward slash support to find out more. Our prayer is that we connect with the right partners and together let's sow into the digital mission field and impact lives far and wide. God bless. Hi friends, this week's midweek service sermon was from Arnold Lim shared at First Baptist Church Subang and titled Comforting Others. Listen to that and other sermons at raymarad.io or anywhere else you get your podcast. And now for this week's interview. Welcome to Rema Radio, the weekly podcast on faith, culture, music and more. I'm Victoria Ong and my guest today is Sasibai Kimis, founder of Earth Air, a social enterprise that champions ethical fashion and heritage craftsmanship. Today, I'll be speaking with Sasi about why she left a successful career in the corporate world to dedicate herself full-time to a social cause. So Sasi, Cambridge, Walton, Wall Street, your CV reads a bit like a corporate wish list. And not to mention, I think every Asian parent's dream. <laughs> so what is it that made you leave that career behind to start Earth Air? Um, okay, it's kind of like a long journey, I suppose. And I think it actually ch- started in my childhood because um, my parents... My mom is from India, so my dad used to take us to India in the summers. So early on, when we used to go and visit my grandma in India in Tamil Nadu, I would, I mean, I was, I saw poverty, uh, you know, and our middle class life in Malaysia seemed like a huge luxury. And this was around, you know, when I was six, seven years old that I started seeing this. And so throughout my life, and as I was growing up in my childhood, I became very aware of class difference and social status difference, right? And I think in you know that sort of built on to the time when um, once uh, when I was seventeen, before I went to university, I went to India again to visit my grand uncle, and my grand uncle had spent most of his life working in Malaysia and sending money back to his family in India, but at the end of his life, his family refused to take care of him and he from the time we saw him he actually died two weeks later and the state that I saw him in was like he was kind of like a beggar on the road uh, lying down with flies all around him and I remember thinking to myself then like it really broke my heart because this is someone I loved and someone who sacrificed their lives and worked hard but you know at the end of their life they struggled and and died quickly and so I thought oh you know, there's clearly a lot of poverty. So I want whatever I do with my life from now on, it has to like make a difference. How old were you then? This was when I was uh, 16 before I went to university. Um, So then, you know, I went to uni, I went to Wharton and the typical path from Wharton is like, okay, are you going to be an investment banker or a management consultant? Or just two? (laughs) Well, at the time, the tech bubble was, I mean, the tech industry is also there. But in 2000, you know, the bubble burst. Um, so things kind of changed. So in the end, I ended up working in investment banking. I went to Lehman Brothers um, in New York. And that within six months, my heart was already not in it. It was, 
I don't I mean sometimes I think oh maybe I'm just lazy you know but it was it was so hard to be in something and to be working hard at something where people really didn't care about what's happening around the world it's like this finance bubble where all we cared about was like making money for the companies that we were working with you know millions and billions of dollars and so within 6 months I submitted my application to do a masters in Cambridge uh and study environment and development because I thought I really want to see how um you know I want to understand why poverty exists because there is enough food there's enough money you know how can we change this you know I want to understand more about the environmental factors that, that are keeping people poor or you know because the poor are the most affected by environmental damage not um you know people of of more ability um and so after I did that um I then ended up working in Malaysia and then I ended up working in Ghana for 2 years and that started with me work doing an internship with the UN uh UNDP in Accra um and then I ended up working with a NGO in in Ghana and it was during that time that I really saw okay this is an NGO doing great work But then at one point because Ghana was considered more like a developing African nation the uh, aid agency started cutting off donations like funds for programs because they're like oh Ghana is developing is not as poor so then you know we were suddenly so, the NGO Let's do a bit of a rewind so from yeah. your time at Lehman Brothers to uh-huh. Ghana how yeah. long was that Um so I graduated well from Lehman I left in uh 2001 and then I was in Ghana in 2004 Mm. Yeah. Wow, um, that's yeah. quite a few years in yeah. between. So, I was still quite young then. I was about 24, 25. Um so at that point like I mean there was very little awareness of Africa in general. I mean in Malaysia even people just think everyone in Africa is starving, you know. And so my parents were worried like they're like, "Oh, where are you going?" you know, like are you going to be safe, you know, da da da. But so I borrowed like 20,000 ringgit for my mom. <laughs> I was just about to ask about the yeah, money. Yeah, How did you leave money behind? Um, yeah, no, I borrowed money and then like I went. <laughs> so my friends real. thought like, oh, what is the pit thing to do? Like who would borrow money to go and volunteer? But but to me, like going to Africa was like a dream. Like I wanted to go there and I wanted to see firsthand like what what's happening on the ground and So working with the NGO was great because we were working with like really poor communities affected by gold mining companies um because Ghana has some of the world's biggest gold reserves yeah that's why it used to be called the gold coast um yeah and so while I was there that's when I realized you know we're doing a lot of good work but then the donations and funding is cut off then we can't help these people anymore so I was like this sucks you know we have to be able to find a way that we can keep doing good by earning money to keep it running. You know, I think that was my my first introduction to the idea of a, of social enterprise. Because at that point then we started doing consulting projects for big companies. So the consulting projects that we did would feed our like all our welfare programs. Um and after Ghana I ended up going back to London uh, and working in a private equity hedge fund advisory firm for 2 years in London. And then I came back to Malaysia and I worked at Kazana and the whole return to Malaysia in itself was like a big thing because for me that was like I felt in my heart that God was calling me to do something you know but I was too enamored in my finance banking world like I was like oh I'm building my career I'm making a lot of money <laughs> you know and so but then I don't know how to explain it there was just this heaviness in my heart that he wants me to do something but I didn't know what. Okay, we'll come back very shortly to hear more about why Sasi returned to finance before starting Earth Air. So stay with us. One of the most needed work in East Malaysia, especially in Sabah, is to have more Christian hostels whereby students can be brought for improving their academic performance but more importantly to nurture them spiritually we need more people to come and join hands with us to do this there is a need for more Christian hostels to be set up in strategic areas especially near form 6 colleges we need more long term partners and churches who are willing to make investments into this long term ministry If you feel called to and moved by God to do so, you can contact me 
My name is Ng Ki Chuan and you can contact me at 019-820-6162. Again, my number is 019-820-6162. Welcome back to Rema Radio, the weekly podcast on faith, culture, music and more. I've been speaking with Sasibai Kimis, founder of Earth Air, about her journey towards being a social business owner. So Sasi, before we went for the break, you were telling us about why you went back into finance before coming back out to start Earth Air. What happened? Um, okay, so that was kind of like financial reasons, uh, I suppose, because I... Basically, all the money that I earned while I was working in Africa, I paid off some of my educational loans. I paid off my parents. And um, also, I got into a car accident uh, while I was there. I was just a passenger. But at that point, Ghana didn't have great medical facilities. There's only like one CT scan machine in the whole country. And I needed like a brain scan. So my my parents were like, oh, okay, okay, enough. Please go back Time to, to a country. <laughs> yeah. They're like, please go back to a country where there's good medical care. So I was like, okay, la, fine. You know, I've done two years and so I can go back. And actually, when I went back to London, I wanted to work with a development consulting firm because I was my passion was still really like, you know, I want to do things that are making a difference. But mm. it was so hard to get a job there. But this private equity you know, advisory firm gave me a job. They're like, oh, your background is so varied. We like your background. Mm. So we don't know what job we have for you, but we want to hire you. So, Life. Yeah, so they just hired me and then kind of put me in, you know, in different uh, private equity and uh, hedge fund work. And so I did that. And then, you know, when I was getting towards the age of 30, um, I started thinking about like, you know, being Malaysian and, you know, my parents being at home and they're getting older. So I really thought, okay, maybe I should go back and spend time with my parents while they're still able. And because I think, you know, when we're children, we know our parents differently. And then when we grow up, we get to know our parents in a different way. And so I wanted to spend time with them before like, oh, I only come home when they're like chronically ill, you know, and they can't move and they can't talk or whatever. So, and also I was tired of complaining about Malaysia from outside, you know, and I thought um, I should come back and try to make a difference. And there was also like, before, like at one point I was in Malaysia, I went to a church and I heard a prophetic vision. Um, and the pastor said that he was from India and he said, I see a vision of flames of fire all over this country. And at that point, I remember thinking, what? That's not possible because this country is so against, you know, Christianity or, you know. Um, so I thought, oh, but what if that vision is something that God wants me to be a part of? to help to make that happen, right? So it's like, if all the good people leave, you don't have a nucleus to make change happen. So you need to you need to go back and help to create that nucleus. So that's kind of why I came back. Um, and so while I was at Kazana, you know, it was great introduction back to Malaysia. And then after like two and a half years of working at Kazana, one night I was driving home, fell asleep, then I woke up and I thought, okay, this is it lah. This is the <laughs> ultimate wake up call. Literally. Yeah. So I was like, okay, you know, if I want to do anything with my life, now is the time. And so I decided to take time off um, and I decided to go to YWAM to, uh, you know, to learn more about God and why. Because like you said, you know, my CV, I had built it up to be this shiny thing where I pursued the best in my career, the best in my education and everything that I did in life was like, oh, I want to do the best. But then when it came to my relationship and knowledge with God, it was like just a Sunday, Sunday school thing. And I, you know, so I was like, why is it that with respect to God, I have given him the least of myself? Wow. You know, so I thought, no, I need to go and find out and I need to spend time with God. So YWAM was amazing in that way. Like it really changed my relationship. It, I went for a discipleship school and it was during my time at YWAM that I was like in Cambodia and we were building churches, building schools um, that I met with weavers uh, and I met with women and men who were struggling to make money and I just started buying from them to sell to my friends and family and it was a hobby um it wasn't a real business then i never intended it 
to be a real business until I met Dr. Kim Tan and he heard what I was doing and he was like, uh, young lady, <laughs> you need to register a business and make this into a real business so that you can continue to help these women sustainably. So, Did you ever think about that? No, I was scared because I was like, what? I know I went to Wharton, I know I studied business, but <laughs> studying business and running a business is so different, you know. Um, How interesting. Yeah, and I, was, and, and I was scared. I mean, there was a lot of ego in it as well because I was like thinking, Alama, you know, <laughs> my CV was like so nice and then now if I do this thing and it fails, mm. what will people think of me? Wow. You know, so like real. it was... And then plus, if I was to do this, I have to start from the bottom, like from nothing, you know, but I ended up putting like most of my life savings into this. And one thing I'm going to share is actually in this process of trying to figure out like when I came back from YWAM, what I was going to do next. I had a dream one night and it was a dream because I've always admired Joseph. He's one of the characters in the Bible that I really see as a role model and so I had a dream that you know when Joseph was in power and he had all the storage the storehouses of the grains right during um, the famine and um, so in that dream I, I dreamt that I also had these storehouses full of grain but then when I went to look at the grain the grain was all worms so all of it was worms so then I was like okay God so you don't want you me to store up, up wealth. You know, you don't want me to depend on money and wealth for my security and identity. And that's when I knew like this journey was <laughs> what he was calling me on. And it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be filled with wealth and money, but he's going to lead me through it. Yeah. Wow. Shocking dream that it led you to where you are. Yeah. We'll be back shortly to hear more about... <laughs> Sassy's pretty incredible journey. So stay with us. Hope, do we dare hold on to it even when the world screams for us to let go? This 21st to 23rd December, 8pm, head down to Agape Community Church Seremban to experience the splendour of Agape's original Christmas musical, Hope. Set in beautiful London, a story of hope told from a perspective of a cheerful young girl who crosses paths with hurting individuals. This musical will take you on an emotional roller coaster with tragic tales, quirky moments, familiar carols, and amazing dance numbers. And guess what? It's absolutely free. You won't want to miss this. For more details, check out agapesaramban.org. Remember, once you choose hope, anything's possible. Welcome back to Rema Radio, the weekly podcast on faith, culture, music, and more. I've been speaking with Sasibai Kimis, founder of Earth Air, about how she got into this business. Sasi, um, you were just telling us about a very vivid dream that you had, but I'm very curious to find out as well for people who may be listening and feeling inspired. Um, those who are working their way up the corporate ladder, especially, should everyone go down the path that you did, you know, like stop earning so much money and go and devote yourself to something that is meaningful, that, you know, has a higher purpose in that sense. What are your thoughts? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, one of the things we learned at YWAM is, you know, the seven pillars of, like, you know, government, legal system and business. And so I actually think that we need Christians everywhere. And, and I think that you can make a lot of difference in a place that you are. I mean, and that goes back to maybe I can kind of share like what I'm thinking now after running out there for five years. I'm actually beginning to feel like, you know, I want to be more involved in policy making and change in the sense that, I mean, it's related to Earth Air, it's related to rural development and poverty reduction. But now I'm thinking like, oh, how do I get more skilled to be able to change policy, you know, and have impact on the government? So if you are in government, for example, you have that opportunity to do that, you know, so... I don't think that everyone needs to like, oh, leave everything and like start from scratch and have this like story of like, oh, you know. And, and no, I, but it's such a it's such a powerful and inspiring narrative, right? I yeah. mean, when people hear it, they're just like, oh, should I do it too? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we talked about this earlier, and, uh, you know, outside and I was, you know, like I was saying, I actually think that 
people do glamorize the whole idea of entrepreneurship now <laughs> more than any time in history, perhaps. Because now we have so many of these big, great success stories and tech startups and everyone's like, oh, I want to be a billionaire, right? And and that's it's not, not that that is wrong. It's great. But I'm just saying that the journey to get there is not what you see. You only see the success. But you don't know what people have gone through behind that success. And I actually recently posted this article called Entrepreneurship Porn on my Facebook page. And I think that's a very good read for a lot of people. The title itself is pretty catchy already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I would say like, you know, obviously you have to listen to what God has to say and God, what God wants you to do, right? And and again, I think what you were asking earlier about, you know, it's, Purpose, passion, and what was the third? Profit. Profit. So finding that sweet spot. Yeah, and and doing that is really hard. Um, at least I have found, like you know, it's it's been a hard journey for me. And Earth Air in the last five years has been as much uh, to prove the social enterprise model as much as discipling me. Like some of my lowest moments at Earth Air, like I just wanted to shut it down. I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I? like, you know, wasting my life and my talents and earning so little money hmm. and making so little money for this company when, like my dad would say, I mean, my dad being Asian father, right, he was kind of disappointed that I decided to do this because he was like, wow, I spent so much money on your education and invested <laughs> so ROI. much in you. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, what are you doing now? Selling scarves and bags, you know? <laughs> so he's like, oh, you're wasting your life, you know, please go back and go back to Kazana and make money again. Um, you know, so when you're thinking like that and you're looking at, you know, just the financial sort of ROI, um, it's easy to lose track of the fact that, like, I realized that Earth Air was God's, is God's vehicle to disciple me. Wow. Because if I was to think about the 40 years or the seven years and all of the biblical characters that went through a period of trial, for me, this was it. Because this is where God broke me down, broke down my ego, took me through a path of humility of having nothing and being able to build myself and my identity on Him and not on my CV and how much money I had in the bank. It's still a pretty good CV now though, to be fair. To I mean, fair. that helps, definitely has helped, uh, you know, because now... When I meet people, they don't just think of me as like, oh, some random girl who's trying to help the world or save the world. They look at my background and they see, oh, okay, she's legit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Can you share though? I mean, you just shared about your downtimes. But were there certain moments, I'm sure there were, mm -hmm. but certain moments that stood out in terms of, man, I really am in the spot where God wants me to be, where everything just makes sense in terms of earth, air and your calling and your purpose. Yeah, um... I think that's definitely happened when um, there were times when, you know, things were just working out in terms of, I'd, you know, I'd be praying for something like, Lord, we need marketing help. I don't know how to do this. Because, I mean, running Earth Air, right, is so different from what I studied in my background in the sense that I didn't know anything about retail or fashion or design or supply chains. I mean, this is completely different from what I used to do with being in, you know, a, a banker, right? So... Everything that I needed, I had to pray and ask God to bring people alongside to help me in all of the areas that I didn't know anything about, you know. And so, you know, we would pray, like my business partners and I, and then like two weeks later, like someone would have said, oh, I read this article about you on this magazine and, you know, I wanted to get in touch with you and like, how can I help? Then I was like, oh, then he's like, oh, my background is in marketing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we just prayed for this. Wow. You know, so my business partners and I have talked about this. And we said, you know, like this, like Earth Air has been, has increased our faith so much. Because we realized that we need to rely on, on God for, for everything that we need, you know. And he uses our talents and our passions and our brains. Um, but at the same time, like learning to to depend on him and not on, on my own thinking and my own abilities was something that was very hard for me to do. Any final thoughts on how people can find that sweet spot? Um, so for me, when I started this journey, I, I had spoke to another Christian entrepreneur friend, Brian Wong. Him and his wife run Pure Health in Plaza Damas. 
And Brian actually told me to write my personal mission statement. And so he worked with me for like a few weeks or something. And I spoke to a lot of other entrepreneurs. And, you know, I wrote like my, okay, what what is the core, like, vision of what motivates me, what drives me, right? And I wrote that down. And I actually wrote a two-pager about the process that I went through and how people can think through that. So that really was helpful because once I did that, any business idea, because you know when you're, when you're not doing anything, right, there's so many things you can do, you know, because people will say, hey, why didn't you do this? Hey, why didn't you do that? Hey, why didn't you look at this? And then you're so confused. Hmm. But then when I had my mission statement, then I looked at all the ideas I had. I was, I was able to like, oh, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. You know, this doesn't match my mission statement. So I'm going to let it go. So I would highly encourage people to do that. And if they want this mission statement document, just email me. Hmm. Wow, very good hook. What's your email address? Um, it's sasibai, S-A-S-I-B-A-I, at earthair.com. Okay, that mission statement. Very good to hear. Any final, final thoughts on the faith journey? So mission statement is one, but yeah. what do you practice just to keep your sanity and your focus? Um. I think one of the biggest things I've learned is from another missionary friend. Um, she said, you know, she's like, Sassy, what happens at Earth Air is a direct reflection of your prayer life. And I realized that when my prayer life was the weakest and poorest was when I struggled the most with why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and recently, uh, another like mentor, you know, helped us understand a revelation that, you know, he said, maybe God has only given you what you need when you need it and not more is because he hasn't really seen that your heart is fully committed in this. And I was thinking like, what? I gave five years of my life really, you know, but I guess at the same time, I always had other options. You know, people would offer me other jobs and I'd always be thinking, oh, I could be doing this and earning so much more money. Why am I doing this? So when your mind is two-sided, like do, that Divided. duality is there, you're not fully committed to this. But then now I finally feel like, okay, I know these other options are there, but I know that I'm doing this for a greater reason than just financial ROI. So, Thanks for being so real, Sassy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we've been speaking with Sassy, um, who runs Earth Air and really just been blown away by the very real story behind Earth Air, how it all started and how she's journeyed through five years, five years of running a social enterprise. And you've been listening to Rema Radio, the weekly podcast on faith, culture, music and more. You fill me with a melody and the words inside my heart Closer than we've ever been, I don't know just where to start Right now, every part of me longs to be where you are So here I wait from day to day That I may ride along the rivers of your mercy That I may ride along the rivers of your love How can I hide myself away from heaven? Before I knew just who you were All I know it was meant to be How you set me apart You told me I have a destiny No more shackles from my past So here I wait from day to day That I may ride along the rivers of your mercy
That I may ride along the rivers of your love How can I hide myself away from heaven Forever I'll ride along the rivers of your love That I may ride along the rivers of your mercy Hi, my name is Brenda Yong, one of the licensed financial advisor by Bank Negara and Securities Commission of Malaysia. Today, I'd like to uh, extend a prayer to all of us outside who are searching for the true self and living desire to live to a life of destiny. Father, to lift up each and every one of us in Malaysia. Father, we want to thank you for the May 9 story that you have transformed Malaysia and the nation can be born in a day. We witness the powerful, powerful hand of God in Malaysia. We thank, we as the Malaysian passport holder and IC holder, we thank you for such a great breakthrough for this nation. Father, we want to call forth each and every one of us, especially Christian out there, who are searching for an identity, searching for the truth to set us free, searching for the true destiny of what we are called for. Father, we are the royal priesthood, the chosen generation, and we need to know who we are in you and what is your destiny for each and every one of us. Father, we call forth each and every one of the Malaysian that is in your kingdom to rise to the position, to rise to the destiny call of our generation so that, Lord, you can use us mightily to transform, ignite and to rebuild this land, Malaysia, the beloved land of Malaysia. Lord, may your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Alex and I am attending Bangsa Lutheran Church and my verse uh, which I've held on to is from Micah 6, 8. But it's already made plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It is quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. This segment features music from Grace Worship. Do connect with us at facebook.com slash rhemard10. Comment, like and share our weekly show so we can do more. Contact us at hello at rhemard.io. We would love to hear from you. Listen to all past shows by searching Rema Radio on the following apps. iTunes, Google Podcast, SoundCloud or anywhere else you can get your podcast. This episode was edited and mixed by Veronica Ng and recorded by Moses Chan at Prodeo Studio. Until our next show, have an overcoming week ahead. I found it on Rima Radio.